One is tempted to see in flight a boundless expanse where ideas may soar nearly as high as imagination can take them. Nothing could be further from the truth. Flight is not and never has been a boundless expanse. Rather, aviators and astronauts live with immutable rules, inescapable constraints, physical and scientific limits that stand as surely before them as gravity itself. It is, however, the job of those who innovate to overcome limits. New engines, new materials, new design concepts force old limits out of the way and turn over to flight testing the mysteries of the new ones. Ironically, finding though the parameters of new limits can be as frustrating today as it was in the early years of flight. However, once done, once the new boundaries are set, one's imagination is free to explore new horizons to be part again of the timeless challenge to find the limits of flight. a science of limits. There are limits on speed, altitude, g-forces, limits on weapons, weights, loadings, and countless other variables. Worse yet, limits are sometimes difficult to conceptualize. Not so in rocketry. Rocketry has given us some of the most spectacular demonstrations of limits ever the smallest out of balance, the tiniest variance in thrust or burn rate leaves a booster out of control and doomed to failure.
military strategists and frontline pilots alike deal with a bewildering array of limitations. In each phase of flight, takeoffs to landings, these limitations change. What is desirable offensively is often unavailable with current technology. Getting airborne has presented not only the greatest challenges, but also some of the most interesting solutions. The zero-length takeoff mat-arrested landing system was a daring solution. Rail-mounted launchers, mats and arrestor cables for recoveries. Furthermore, a jet could be launched from any terrain, and the takeoff, exerting a tolerable 3.5 Gs and achieving 175 miles per hour by bottle separation, was comfortable for the pilot. Another design initiative was the jet-assisted takeoff. Extra thrust augments the aircraft's engines, providing power sufficient to overcome short field limitations, unusually high gross weights, or unimproved field conditions. Planners could vastly expand their options with this wider takeoff envelope. The JATO bottles were dropped shortly after liftoff. Vertical takeoff and landings have intrigued military tacticians for years. Absolute and complete mobility has been the allure. Early concepts, though, were fraught with problems and themselves had as many limitations 
as the physics they were wrestling with. The most promising aircraft in the line of successful test beds for vertical takeoff and landings was the Ryan X-13 VertiJet. It achieved its design objectives, but human factors, most notably the limited forward visibility, thwarted the project. the ideas tested though, the only V-Stall aircraft to actually join the frontline fleets was the AV-8B Harrier. These early trials show its predecessor, the Sea Harrier. Branching off from the main body of aeronautical design was this ungainly platform that dealt the laws of physics their blow by combining the sheer power of turbofan engines with the finesse of hydrogen peroxide thruster rockets. A predecessor to the lunar landing module, the Bell LLRV's first flights were sobering reminders of how powerful limits can be. Gross takeoff weights were a pesky limitation in the days of early gas-guzzling jets, 
so engineers proposed a simple solution. Extra wheels. After takeoff, let them fall away. More recently, engineers applied their thinking to overcome a takeoff obstacle poorly understood just years ago, wake turbulence. At issue, launching the maximum number of aircraft in the smallest amount of time. The problem, the separation required for wake turbulence avoidance hadn't been evaluated. Through minimal interval takeoff testing and a quick turnout, these B-1 bombers were able to launch just 12 seconds apart. Once airborne, the engineer and the pilot face a whole new array of limitations. Often they are simple problems gear door flutter, for instance, that are only noticeable once airborne. More commonly, in-flight limitations are anticipated and test flights are planned to define their parameters. A good example of this is store separation. Engineers know that the release of stores will affect other components, but until tested, they can only theorize the outcomes. Therefore, every manner and configuration of separation tests are undertaken. The results are often entirely unexpected. By and large, in-flight conditions are the daily toil of the test pilot. Dozens and dozens of limits are evaluated. The maximum air speeds for opening the canopy. An air brake on the A7D. Flare separations, a new countermeasure on the B-1B. Once airborne, nothing is more vital than the development of the very last safety system in the jet, the ejection seat. One of the most important milestones was a successful supersonic ejection. The B-58 Hustler, seen here with its fuselage crew compartment opened, was the test bed for the first successful supersonic ejection. As with all major systems, a human test under controlled conditions precedes acceptance into the main body of the fleet.
While amusing to watch, the bottom bailout system was actually incorporated in the Navy's F-3D Sky Knight Night Fighter. Note how violent the forces become at high air speeds. Wind blast blows the shoes and helmet off the tester, an incident certain to result in an advisory placard of a new limitation found. Every manner of conditions and limitations are encountered by the pilot on landing. Most days, the wind is down the center line and the jet is glued to the crosshairs. Other days, there are snakes in the cockpit. So vulnerable was the B-52 to crosswinds that steerable off-center landing gear was necessary. Troops and supplies need to go where they need to go, improved field or not. This C-5 tests landing on dirt strips, complete with dust. Depending on where you fly, water on the runway may be a daily condition, sometimes with extreme accumulations. Testing hydroplaning and landing speeds on wet runways is yet another job for the test pilot. Foam landings and arrested landings provide crippled aircraft with options that enhance their margins for an uneventful recovery under less than ideal circumstances. This F-111 tests the cable's effectiveness with a heavy fighter. Although completely undesirable, wheel fires are common enough to demand the attention of test engineers and pilots. This 767's taxi test 
takes the wheel assemblies to the rubber's flashpoint and then measures the aircraft's ensuing loss of control. Going hand in glove with aircraft limitations are human limitations. At question, can the pilot tolerate the proposed system or the new performance measure? Is it safe? Have the human factors been given sufficient consideration? If not, engineers will go back to their drawing boards. Oftentimes, new designs require testing of old systems. Such was the case with the T-38. Tandem seating raised the question, who ejects first? The answer, unless the back seater went first, the front seater's rocket would kill him. The sled proves useful in any number of tests. Risky designs showed their weak points when accelerated to supersonic speeds, while solid advances showed their colors. As plastic radomes went supersonic, questions arose about their susceptibility to rain damage. Sled tests to 1,670 miles per hour in heavy rain proved that there was no danger. Perhaps the most interesting study of human factors came about because of terrain-following radar and the F-111 that used it for high-speed, low-level interdiction. At issue, bird strikes. What ensued was a lengthy series of tests designed first to build a predictive computer model and then to build a safer, transparent crew enclosure. Up to nine inches of inward deflection was recorded.
remotely powered vehicles, RPVs, take the pilot out of the equation. When successfully launched, RPVs may be used for target practice, weapons delivery, or surveillance. Nothing sharpened the quest for speed more than air combat, but returning World War II pilots knew that speed was a double-edged sword, and that breaking the sound barrier was the first order of priority in flight testing. In 1947, the sound barrier was a flight limitation forever put aside by the X-1 and its pilot, Chuck Yeager.
The years ensuing Jaeger's historic run were truly the golden years of flight. All types of ideas and design innovations were tried and tested. Home to these wonder years of aviation, and home still to the Air Force's Flight Test Center, is Edwards Air Force Base. With year-round VFR conditions, 60 miles of marked runways, and dry lake beds as far as the eye can see, test pilots feel an extra margin of safety and comfort when flying over Edwards. The XF-91 Thunderceptor, with wings designed to delay stalls, actually gained fame for achieving supersonic speeds in level flight. looked as if it flew at Mach 3 while it was standing still, but failed to live up to its Mach 2 expectations. The XF-85 Goblin was proposed as a ride-along fighter escort that would drop from its mothership at the first hint of trouble. The X-15, though, did as much to push back the limits of flight as any aircraft flown. It achieved top speeds of three, four, five, and six times the speed of sound, 4,000 miles per hour. to altitudes of 100,000 feet, 200,000 feet, 300,000 feet, up to its final achievement of 354,000 feet. provided engineers with a test bed to study controllability in the thin upper reaches of the atmosphere. Hydrogen peroxide thruster nozzles were built into the Starfighter, as was a 6,000 pound rocket that would boost the jet to altitudes in excess of 100,000 feet. limits are the bars over which aviation and aviators must hurdle. What seems insurmountable today might be solved by an inventor tinkering in an obscure laboratory tomorrow. What, though, is certain is this.
In flight, nothing remains the same. If you fail to innovate, to move the bar higher, the enemy will do it for you. And in military flight, maintaining the advantage is the truest challenge of flight. And here comes the anticipatory, about 1.22, that's acceptable, we'll go. Eagle 06 is in the pool, and the SR arm is on in consent. Good for it, Mr. Mello. Eagle 06 is in the recovery. Hey, how are you, beautiful son of a bitch? Eagle, Eagle 06, lost control, unable, verify master arm to safe position, no video came off. 